Welcome to the 2022 AIA Baltimore and Baltimore Architecture Foundation Spring Lecture Series. My name is Randy Sovich, co-chair of the Lecture Series Committee with Kelly Dans. The series brings nationally and internationally recognized speakers to speak about design in relation to ti timely themes and to draw connections to relevant issues here in Baltimore. This year's lecture series is celebrating its 44th anniversary. On behalf of AIA Baltimore and BAF, thank you for joining us. This wouldn't be possible without the generous support and partnership our sponsors offer. Please see their names on the slides um, that, are, that are scrolling right now. Today's speaker is Angeliki Scioli, PhD. She is Assistant Professor of Architecture and the Chair of Methods of Analysis and Imagination at TU Delft. She hails from Greece, where she obtained her professional diploma in architecture from the University of Thessaly and was granted a post-professional master's in architectural theory and history by the National Technical University of Athens. She completed her doctor of philosophy in the history and theory of architecture at McGill University. She is a registered architect and has worked on projects ranging from residential and office buildings to the design of small scale objects and books. Her research seeks connections between architecture and literature in the public realm of the city focusing on aspects of embodied perception of place in the urban environment. She has edited the collected volumes, Reading Architecture, Literary Imagination, and Architecture Experience, published by Rutledge in 2018, The Sound of Architecture, Acoustic Atmospheres of Space, Leuven University Press 2022, and two issues of Writing Place, Journal for Architecture and Literature um, in 22, 20, 2021 and 2022. Before joining TU Delft, Scioli taught both undergraduate and graduate courses at McGill University in Montreal, Tech de Monterey in Mexico, and Louisiana State University in the US. Before she presents, I have a little bit of housekeeping. We will do a question and answer at the end. Please use the Q&A box to submit questions. The chat box is for general dialogue, and we will not be reading any questions from there. And so from here, uh, welcome Angeliki, and it's all, it's your show now. Thank you very much, Randy. Let me please share a screen. And that should be okay right now. Randy, Randy Sovich, thank you so very much for a wonderful introduction and for a very, uh, very charming invitation to be here in Baltimore to give this lecture today. And thank you very much to the AIA of Baltimore and BAF for making a small dream of, of mine coming true to be in Baltimore and to be able to interact with the architects of the region and uh, discuss a number of pertinent things. And last but not least, a very special thank you to a very, a very unique architect of Baltimore, Joe Salucci, who has been an amazing uh, force and uh, made this trip and uh, this lecture possible and believes in me for what no reason whatsoever. So the title of my lecture is Stay at Home something that we have heard quite a lot the last two years. The subtitle is a universe ready to be discovered anew. And I hope that this is where we're going to uh, allow ourselves to imagine a little bit in a different way the place where we have spent so much time the last two years. When I received the invitation by Randy to give this lecture at this beautiful lecture series, I looked at the topic and I saw that the main question, um, and I hope very nice, uh, the main question that the lecture series is asking is actually how do we transform, given our current conditions, architecture and design to address rapidly changing needs and demands in our homes, workplaces, and public spaces. And the main question that had to do with the part of the homes really caught my attention. Though, since I'm not currently, as per the title of the lecture series, a designer per se, but I'm more of a researcher, a researcher and an academic, I get a bit worried of how can I bring something to the table that can have pertinence and value in our contemporary situation. I thought that the last two years, two years and a half almost, we have spent an exuberant amount of time in our homes. There are many renovation projects going on, many redecorations. People are trying to make do and work from, work from home and find space within their everyday quotidian space. And there are also many people who have, get, who have become, who are bored and tired with the space of the home. In the Netherlands, actually, where I currently live, we have had so many curfews that were all pretty, 
fed up. So I thought that looking at the banal, at the everyday, at the very quotidian space of our homes with a new perspective might be, that it's, might be something really important at our current conditions. And with this thought, my mind drifted at an architect that I find extremely fascinating, Frederick Kistler. I thought of Kistler and his lifelong interest in redefining what a house should be and how living and everyday life in the house should reveal their magic. Even before the pandemic, Kistler was very, very critical about the housing conditions of, our, of his time, which unfortunately do not differ much from our times. And he used to say, architecture, particularly in housing, has too often become a gamble with people's standard habits and peace for the sake of fashion and fake fame. What price do we pay for our lack of resistance to conformity, Kistler used to ask. The answer to this question becomes more and more paramount for each of us, for our society and as a whole. Art and architecture can and must contribute to the clarification of this issue for us, slaves of indirect living. This is Kistler's words. And you can see him here preparing a manifesto for new standards in life activities advocating against indirect living. So I thought that in a time of the absolute indirect living, where almost everything takes place to a screen, looking at Kistler's attempt to make the place of our house magical is absolutely pertinent. As an architect, Kistler, who was actually really, uh, did most of his work while he was in New York, Kistler worked in a wide range of projects, from stage designs to art exhibitions, to shops, commercials, furniture, and architecture buildings. He really tried his hands on many different projects. The very last image you see here is actually his famous buildings, the Shrine of the Books in Jerusalem, which was completely the very few, a very short time before his, uh, his death. Alongside with his very creative career though, Kistler kept constantly working on a project that he called the Endless House. And you can see here a model of this very house with Kistler still working on it. This housing project, which was very dear to Kistler, was in some way his manifesto against what he considered wrong in the architecture of the time. First and foremost, Kistler was reacting against functionalism. For Kistler, functionalism was basically just a way to standardize routine activities. It allowed the food to actually walk, but not to dance. It allowed the eye to see, but not to envision. It allowed the hand to grasp, but not to create. He believed that architecture should enable what exists beyond the merely practical, and that it should be based on the fullness of life. Some of these beliefs, it may not come as a surprise to you, were actually influenced by his involvement with a surrealist group of artists where they were in New York. You can see him actually here. These are the surrealists in uh, New York. And you can see him actually here at a farewell party for André Breton, the founder of the artistic movement. The surrealists production, art, writers and, art, and artists, was heavily driven by the ambition to reveal meaning in everyday life. Breton's essay, The Crisis of the Object, that was published in 1936, specifically called for a creative relationship between the real and what exists beyond the real, and for the necessity to reveal the marvelous, to reveal the wonderful, to reveal the inspiring in our everyday life. Along the same, key, as from the same lines then, Kistler's Endless House shared many of these surrealist intentions, and evolve in new directions. Our Kistler really believed that an architecture should shelter those endless mutations of life force, which seem to be part of the practical as well as of the magical, and could offer its inhabitants an exuberant life. Although Kistler worked for the Endless Project almost 30 whole years of his life, always on the side of all these other projects, we are not left with much, to be honest. We have some models, you can see here, some few sketches, 
and two sets of drawings, which Kistler drafted for a client that was interested in building the house, a commission that was never actually realized. This material on its own does not really give us allowance to imagine much about how the life of the inhabitants would have been inside this unique environment. It does not allow us to imagine all these things that Kistler advocated for. What we have though, that is really important in actually deciphering this wonderful project, is Kistler's own words. Kistler talked and wrote about the endless house in interviews, articles, and most importantly, in the book that you see on your screens, titled Inside the Endless House, which was published six months after his death. In the pages of this book, he collected ideas, opinions, thoughts about architecture, and impressions from his many trips around the world. He also, though, collected his thoughts and intentions for the house over the course of these years. And from this very book, which is more than 500 pages, I will read it today to you some few experts in order to help you imagine along with me how Kistler envisioned the inhabitants' life in the endless house. The form of the endless house had changed over the years of the work. You can see here a very early sketch, but what had never changed is the things that Kistler imagined for the interior. He thought that nothing in the house can be taken for granted, and he really insisted on that. Nothing can be taken for granted, either of the house itself, the floors, the walls, the ceiling, the coming of people or of light, the air with its warmth or coolness. So let me please take these elements mentioned by Kistler one by one, the floor, the wall, the ceiling, and discuss them through the drawings and the things Kistler wrote for them. Let's start with the entrance. As you can see from the model, the house is raised on three columns, three pretty gigantic columns, so that as Kistler explained in an interview in CBS in 1960, cars can actually drive underneath. He had a fascination for cars, Kistler, and you can actually see him in an automobile exhibition. If we study closely the drawings, we can see that each column give access to a staircase. You can see here on the plan, I have noted the columns and the interior. The middle staircase rises into the house's central area, indicated by the word living. The north staircase leads directly to the parents area and is actually the only one that you can see as you drive towards the house. The circular staircase inside the south column ascends into the kitchen. Both the north and the south staircases seem to be reserved for private use by the inhabitants, as the ground staircase is the only one that has been indicated with the arrows, as you can see in the plan. The architectural drawings, what you see in front of you, convey only part of Kistler's larger idea about the ritual of entering. On May 14th of 1961, during a visit to Palm Beach, Florida, to examine a, pot to examine a potential lo lot for the building, Kistler explained to the lot's owner and prospective client way more about the experience of entering. No one can enter the endless house with shoes on, he said. That goes for the family as well as for guests. To be specific, there will be dressing quarters close to the entrance of the house for men, women, and children with an exuberant wardrobe of capes, saris, punctures, in many colors, textures, weights, and sizes to be worn either loosely or tightened over the body. It was interesting for me, Kistler continues, to hear of a silk and shoe manufacturer from Hong Kong who offered at once to deliver free of cost slippers without soles, just covering the arch, made with many colored feathers or silk, velvet or furs, because I made it clear to him that everyone's home is a sacred place and the silent walk is imperative. The drawings, as you already saw, show no such dressing quarters filled with all these very special outfits that Hitler, Hitler imagines and talks about. But the middle entrance room is spacious enough to accommodate such quarters. What we can imagine from the architect's descriptions is that the ritual of entering barefoot and dressed in appropriate clothes would prepare both inhabitants and visitors 
To leave behind the mundane, noisy, chaotic world and emerge into a space that should be understood, felt, and appreciated as sacred. Moving inside the endless house now, as soon as we have entered, challenges the very activity of walking. As one's walk takes place on curvilinear floors with different slopes and levels. There are no flat floors inside the endless house. You can already see a bit in the model, but more specifically in the west and east elevation, we can discern at least four slightly different floor levels with no stairs or ramps in between them, indicated in the main floor plan. The same is confirmed if we examine the two longitudinal sections on the other set of drawings that we have. An entry in the journal on, May, on March 23rd of 1961 reveals a very fascinating intention that the architect had for the floors. In the endless house, he writes, there is the concept of the floors which are treated in such a curvilinear way that they seem to be moving under your feet. They are not flat and you, when you walk barefooted on them, the lifting and setting down of your body plus moving at the same time is like discovering your potentiality of flying. This is one example of reconsidering our reflexes, Kistler insists. Our life is conditioned by whatever we create around us. Just this one idea of a new floor would bring us much closer to truth within nature because we would be using our feet not to walk on shoes and throw them on floors, but on the floor directly. Keeping in mind this intention and looking at the drawings again, it's really not difficult to imagine that walking inside the endless house requires a conscious adjustment of one's steps, especially in the steeper parts of these curvilinear floors. After waking up, let's say in the parents' area, in the bedroom, and in order to go all the way to the kitchen for a morning coffee, for example, one would transverse four different slopes I'm not really sure if this is what I need before my morning coffee booster, but this is what the architect intended. Kistler also envisioned different floor materials that would enrich the experience of walking. One more piece of information that does not show in the drawings at all. The floors of the endless house, he said, will have many textures such as pebbles, sand, rivulets, grass, planks, heated terracotta tiles, so that everyone can by touching the floor be stimulated by the touch. We should learn to live not only on the floor, but with the floor. Unfortunately, he did not specify the different materials that would be distributed throughout the house and how, but still imagine having a house with floors made out of rivulets. The walking experience that Kistler created for the inhabitants was then extended into a similar treatment of walls and ceilings. You can see him here inside the model, inside the draft of the model towards the endless house. In the very first versions of the project, there were some typical interior walls, but very soon Kistler gave up on them and the undulating floors basically became sculpturally continuous with the external walls, while the interior walls disappeared to achieve spatial continuity. The sections confirm that very clearly. Walls, floors, and ceiling do not meet one another at sharp angles, but are fused together, but are actually flowing into each other uninterrupted by columns or beams. Kistler was adamant against separation of space. Cubicles, he used to say, for the standard functions of everyday life, like bathrooms and kitchens, are deadening experiences in the long run. If all spaces are kept open and free flowing and can be shut off at will, then they can be inspiring. Then you are the one that you become the architect of your own house. And life has a chance to become inventive. You as the inhabitant, as I said already, are the architect of your house. Following the, following the floors, the walls and the ceiling, we can actually imagine what he thought about the roof. In continuation of all these 
very continuously flowing environment, Kiesler conceived the surface of the roof as a private landscape of low hills and soft meadows. The inhabitants, he thought, could actually enjoy a break during the day and rest under the sun, protected by the shadows of the roof's own volumes. You can see here a sketch of this uh, idea where actually Kistler accompanies it with a quote saying, I always felt that there should be a way of getting onto the roof of the house because it has such lovely valleys where one can sit or lie in full form in delicious comfort, delicious comfort, this is exactly his words, sheltered on its planes and inclinations. Next, pro, next part of the project that he also start, kept thinking in a very inventive way is the furniture. You can actually he, see here Kistler sitting on a very, it's a sketch of Kistler sitting in a very conventional chair. Uh, and as you can imagine, conventional chairs and conventional furniture was nothing like what he wanted for the house. What he envisioned was that the house would provide its own furniture with the inhabitants resting on concave surfaces where floors then turn into walls. There's, this is actually one study by him showing this intention, the inhabitants resting on this in between, between the floor and the wall. A second shell that could be added along, the cert along certain parts of the interior wall would actually provide for storage space, cabinets, and especially the dining room, the kitchen, and the sleeping quarter, for which, for the sleeping quarters, Kistler wanted no beds. During a trip to Sao Paulo, he was so fascinated by the view of woven hammocks in between the tree tracks of a forest that he insisted hammocks should be in the endless house instead of beds. From all these tangible elements, the floor, the ceiling, the furniture, Kistler moved uh, in imagining a very important but intangible element of this living experience, the light. The treatment of the light within the house is probably one of the most characteristic ones in showing the architect attempts to make everyday life magical. The wall, floor, and ceiling were intended to carry lighting using electric eyes to turn lights on and off automatically, accompanying the inhabitants wherever they would walk in the house. You can actually see a sketch here with the different light sources from inside, for inside and outside of the house. The lighting system of the endless house would also include moving trolleys to provide light where it was needed and in order to be used according to the everyday activity. Besides artificial light, Kistler was also concerned with natural lighting and fenestration. He believed that fenestration in a new building should not be determined by how the openings look from the outside, if the elevations look beautiful or not, but how the light looks from inside. In his very last article, The Future, Notes and Architecture as Sculpture, he specified that in the endless, each area has vast openings in different shapes and forms according to the orbit of the sun and the prevailing winds. And you can see these big openings here in the drawings. These are not filled with glass. This is another very important information not to be understood by the drawings. These are molded reliefs in colored plastics of various thicknesses so that the heat of the sun is refracted. In, in, in each of these larger or smaller openings, which during the evening, by the way, are receiving artificial lighting from abroad, there are certain sections which are clear and translucent, affording a free view and a visual connection to the outside environment. The drawings show that some of these openings are small, and directed towards the sky, for example, the one on the ceiling of the parents' area over here, that would probably enable them to see the stars before they fall asleep. Others, such as the central areas in the west operations are two stories high. And the larger openings not only bring in natural light into the house, but also seem to serve as external frames that exhibit blurred shadows of the light inside the house towards the outside. They are large enough to frame activities in various places, including the mezzanine, as you can see in the east elevation, and the mezzanine itself, of course. This though sketch is probably the most fascinating element regarding light inside the endless house. 
it's one of the very first versions of the um, of the endless house as a model. You can see the shape is more like an egg and not this multi-curve uh, model that we have been looking at so far. And this element that you can see here on the roof is what Kistler calls the color clock. It's an extraction that I speculate, Kistler never really specifically talked about that, carried all the way through towards the last versions of the house. It's this indication here. And I think that it's a pretty safe speculation believing that this device made it to the end of all his experimentation. This device is described by Kistler in an article which is all about the endless house and its psychological lighting, as he calls it. The color clock, which you can see here, it's a drawing by, by Kistler. This is the roof here, the color clock looking towards the sky, and I will explain what these colors are. The color clock combined prismatic glass and mirrors in here that would receive light from the sun, divide it into spectral colors, and then reflect it throughout the house. Kistler wrote that although it has rarely been done by architects, it's possible to send sunlight through a lens in order to concentrate it and pass it through convex mirror reflex devices to diffuse it. The color clock of the endless house is designed to do this thing, as well as to fill the interior of the house with color and make the, dwell the dweller organically aware of the continuity of light. If we look at the drawing carefully, we can imagine that the sunlight at the dawn of the day would be diffused by a deep yellow mirror, filling the interior of the house with a warm orc light, you can see it here, in order to, to awaken up the body. As the sun would climb higher in the sky, the light inside the house would then change to a more intense red, following the intensity of the activities during the morning. At noon, the color would be more towards a blue, a smooth blue light, a cooling atmosphere during lunch. And then in the afternoon, it would slowly turn into green, a peaceful and relaxing uh, color for preparing us for the end of the day, and then going back at night before the sunset into an ochre color. Instead of relying on a mechanical clock that would basically splinter their day, their day into minute divisions of time, Kistler thought that the inhabitants would become aware of the continuity of time based on the colors of the color clock. There are way more writings by Kistler on many other elements, smaller and bigger of the endless house, but I don't want to tire you long, longer during this lunch lecture, because by now you have all understood what the main and biggest intention of this architect for this very special environment was. Everything had to be about the magical, not even the faucet. Oh, my apologies. Here, not even the faucet, he said, that brings water into your glass, into the teacup, through your shower and into the bath, that turn of the handle, and then the water flowing, as from the rock touched by Moses in the desert, that sparkling event released through the magic invention of man's mind, must always remain the surprise, the unprecedented an event of price. I have often thought about this very magical house, particularly during the pandemic and particularly during the curfew period in the Netherlands. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have windows that look at the stars, a color clock on my roof? However, wouldn't it also these elements make living sometimes difficult or even unbearable, a bit too overwhelming. And even if this kind of living is possible, wouldn't the inhabitants become accustomed to its novelty after a while and just stop being fascinated by the challenges it offers and basically treating it in a banal way that we all treat our everyday houses? I believe that interpreting the endless house literally as a domestic environment is not is not what Kistler actually intended. The fact that supports my hypothesis is that in 1958, Kistler received a big grant to build the endless house in one-to-one -one scale in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. This project never materialized because actually the museum built in the area that the endless house was supposed to be built a permanent 
uh, in a permanent exhibition wing for its temporary exhibition. So Kistler lost this opportunity. But the fact, I keep thinking, the fact that Kistler really wanted the house to be exhibited in a museum reinforces the idea that it was more of a manifesto against the prevailing conditions of living that would enable visitors to experience an environment in which basic, basic, basic everyday functions are basic as questioned. They could walk on its curvilinear wall floors and imagine flying. They could sit on the curved walls and experience the intimacy of their bodies with the flesh of the house. And they could basically understand the passing of time through the colors of the color clock. Like a theatrical performance, it would have transported the participants temporarily to another world to consider certain questions of life and then return them back to their actual everyday living renewed and possibly enlightened. If, if philosopher Giorgio Agamben is correct, that we moderns must find meaning in our biological life rather than in theory or metaphysics or theology, then the endless house is indeed a modern sacred space as Kistler had envisioned. In short, the endless house was designed as a collection of creative movements in order to reveal the divine meaning of life beyond our everyday actions. Because according to Kistler, architecture is striving instead of for simple shelter to be more than that. It is striving persistently to be even more emotional, more than aesthetic. Yet, when buildings are less than all that, less we are too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Angeliki. Now we're open for uh, for questions and answers. Um, questions, we'll try to uh, ask her to answer them. Uh, I have a question for you. There's a project in Japan, I think, um, that's more recent than Kessler. Um, it was a husband and wife. I don't know if you're familiar. I think it was um, the density lofts or something like that. It was this a project where the floors were all colorful. And uh, are you familiar with that? Have no, you seen I it? Don't, no. There were two um, Japanese architects. They were um, in their 70s or 80s, and they built this house where the floors were, were soft. Um, the outside of the building was was not this, yes. this sculpture, but the inside, the floors were soft. You had to climb down to get into the kitchen and climb up, and the colors, it was very colorful. And their argument was that this is what was going to keep them younger. Oh, well, that's fantastic. That, that maneuvering over a, 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 this kind of surface, um, would would uh, you know would would keep you more agile and um, Very nice. I know a lot of people. It seems like Americans they get to a certain age and they want to move from a house with stairs to one floor. So um, so I, I see the floors if, were more the floors were soft. So the, it was not just the very regular. That's fantastic. They would they would bounce and they they rolled up to where you could sit on them and then you would like sit on the floor and then climb down into the kitchen. So you looked into the kitchen and the dining room and I. Um, I will definitely look for this project. Well, yes, I think, yeah, I'm trying to remember their names, but it, I mean, I remember looking at it a number of times, but, you know, um, doing work with senior living, you wouldn't be able to convince someone to do that in a care facility. Yeah, I um, think in the chat we get a link about the house. It would be wonderful yes. to actually contact the, contact the inhabitants, because I'm really curious to see if this kind of living is possible or it's becoming tiresome after a while. Uh, Joe, Joe, thank you, Joe. Joe found the link. It's the uh, density law, reversible density lofts, uh, Mitaka, I think Mitaka, Japan. And it was, uh, uh, Arakawa was the architect. And I'm not gonna look it up, but um, if anybody wants to, we do have a question, um, were the materials needed actually available at the time of the project? Uh, the beautiful thing, I, I think, is that uh, uh, the concrete and the reinforced concrete was, was what made Kistler dream of all these things, because he could actually create, he has talked quite a lot about, uh, he has thought um, there are more, he has thought more detailed about how that section will be, how much thicker that external um, surface would be on the floor and how much thinner it can go all the way towards the floor. He has talked about specific dimensions. Uh, I think from 11 inches to, I'm not really, I don't remember by heart. So these materials were available for sure. The color clock, I'm not really sure, not that the materials were not available, but I don't think that he had thought the physics behind it through. I have mm -hmm. to say that because uh, using the sunlight with this, I'm not sure about that. 
Uh, but then all these other materials, how do you have a place, how do you have a floor with rivulets? I don't know the technology behind that, if that would have happened. How do you have a floor with the grass that you keep maintaining properly? Yes, it would have taken a lot, a lot, a lot of... Uh, On the interior, right. Yes, yes. But the, rain, the rainforest concrete, I think, was for him uh, like a magical thing, ma a magical material for what he wanted to do. Uh, is your research going to lead you to um, build a, a, a three-dimensional model of this or a, a, yeah, CAD, no. a, a, three, uh, a 3D printed uh, version of it? There are. They are actually, they are actually <laughs> in different universities. There are colleagues who, with their students, have tried to do uh, three-dimensional digital models of it. Uh -huh. I, what I hope, what I wish, is that with my students, I, the research will lead us to, to design the color clock. I would really like this challenge to see if we can actually achieve and make a color clock somewhere. Interesting. Yeah, I think because of artificial light, we are so disconnected from all a lot of the the world around us, the cosmos around us. Like, um, we you know ask um, someone what's the cycle of the moon. No one really knows when the moon is out. But if you lived in the landscape in the Midwest, uh, you know, three hundred years ago. When yeah. best, you know, in the United States, you would know when the moon was out full because it would have been brighter and you could get around in, you know, later yeah. in the, in the evening. Was, so, yeah. And what was for me very interesting, if he had ever managed to build it, Kissler received two commissions, possible commissions for this project. One was in Montreal, in Canada, and the other, as I told you, already in Florida. So the lighting conditions are pretty different, right? And the weather right. conditions are pretty different. So I would be very curious to see how some of these elements would work in such extreme changes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a uh, very, yes, what you talk about, what you say about the artificial lighting and how you, used we, we are to that. I, I live now in the Netherlands, which is the northern um, part of the world I have ever lived. So it gets really dark really early in the, in the, in winter. And then we have these long uh, uh, days in the summer. And uh, it's very, it's a very, very different feeling how you understand light when it's a very, it's mm -hmm. so, and uh, our building where we teach um, for efficiency, for uh, saving energy in the office, it's a shared office we have with my colleagues. If we are all sitting and working on our laptops and uh, there's no detection of movement, the lights turn off. So every now and then some of us, we're all working, some of us has to actually clap their hands or move for a little bit, <laughs> something like that. So the lights come on again, it's the joke of, the, of our building. <laughs> So we have another question that hopefully won't be um, making you feel uncomfortable, but it's about your bow tie. There seems to be interest in you. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> is it is it wooden? Yes, it's wooden. <laughs> it's OK. I thought that if I show up with just the black outfit, it would be too <laughs> black and white. So I thought I should be a little bit more <laughs> more playful. I thought that's something that was that you, would have please appreciate it. He would appreciate it. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So what is it like to live in an environment like that that's that's sort of maximum surface and minimum volume, right? Um, because you've got, you know, because you don't have those corners. Um, yes, how do yes. you how do you have how did he he didn't imagine us having very many personal items that we wanted, like knickknacks or bric a brac or no, he was very upset with uh, he was very upset with cubes. He was con he was complaining all the time that the architecture of the time is was just cubes on top of each other all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very upset with angles all the time. He was like, we're not meant to live with angles. There are no angles on our body. There's nothing in our body that requires this, uh, this very ninth degree understanding of the space. And he was really hoping for a more flowing condition. No, in, uh, and it's true that he was not envisioning that the owners, the, the inhabitants would have many personal items or, or a lot of uh, things because um, for, the, for the commission in, uh, New, in Florida, he actually um, revised some of his drawings and made them a little bit more detailed. So he has designed some cabinets by the bedroom and some mm -hmm. cabinets by the kitchen, but still they're very minimal. I think for him, the house itself would provide for everything. Like you could sit on the terracotta tiles, you could sit, you could just even, I didn't mention that, that for, he detested bathtubs. He was calling them, I think, emerald coffins. And uh, he was imagining small pools uh, inside uh, in, in the different spaces. So a small pool in, in, the, in the parents' uh, area, a small pool um, in the kid, kids' area. So you would bathe more freely inside the house. Inside the house. You could just 
walk from your room into the tub and slide. Yeah. We do have a question from one of the panelists uh, from Kelly, I believe. Yeah. Um, it's how do you feel about the term blob detector? That's a very, I was actually hoping for this uh, question. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, Kisler has been, con uh, there are many, there's a lot of researchers and a lot of uh, academics who support that uh, he was a president of blob, blob architecture. I kind of disagree with that because that was not necessarily his intention. It was not that he wanted to create a blob. He wanted to create something that is not interrupted. His emphasis was on the endless. That's why he called the house endless. It's not that it's endless. Of course, it's ending. You can see it's that you couldn't uh, see the ending. It was a continuous thing. So for him, the form was not that much a fascination with the blobs as it became later, but it was a necessity in order to avoid any sharp divisions between materials or any sharp separations in space. So I know that later on, blob architecture really thought that Kistler and the Endless House was a president and all, but the intentions between these, these are pretty different. So I like the term, I have nothing against the term, but I not necessarily connect this uh, trend with uh, Kistler. You don't you don't think it's a he was a, a leader of that or he Not inspired at it at all. Not at and all. what about Ant Farm, the the American firm? Are you familiar with Ant Farm from the sixties and seventies? They were very much inspired, I think, by him as well. They're um, very inspired by him. I don't know their projects that well. They were a firm that one of my faculty, when I was a student, one of the teachers showed us their work. I think in my sophomore year, and uh, but he showed us. You know that they had these curved spaces with round bubble windows and you lived in this environment that was a lot like was inspired by Kessler but then he showed us the kitchen and they had like the you know the, the gas range that sort of didn't really fit into the wall and there was space behind it and they tried to put these commercial appliances that were available in 1960 which aren't as elegant looking as they are today but you know the refrigerators yeah. were rounded on the top and not at the back and the sides so um it's kind of a question there, but let me see yeah. if we have another one from uh, someone is suggesting that we look through the exhibit. NASA glass design covering the front of the building, the glass changes color based on the location this of the, the sunlight. sunlight. Yeah. Now we have a oh, lot it's of a built, It's at the uh, industrial building at the Smithsonian. Very beautiful. Now we have more in technology right now. That's another, that's going coming back to the question, not about the technology of the materials, but the technology. Now we can do a lot of those. Now we can also have a lot of uh, uh, responsive facades and materials that can interact with a number of things. Back then, that was not even a part of the conversation. Right. We have another one from Catherine. Uh, while some of the aspects of the house are not achievable because of building codes, it seems like there are others which could inform current practice. Are there any specific aspects? That you would like to see developed in contemporary practice? Yeah, uh, definitely the um, the colorful glasses in the in the windows, uh, that because they can change the atmosphere of the interior very much. We don't necessarily have to. Actually, this is something that Baragan was doing in Mexico when I visited one of his projects. That really I found very fascinating. Baragan sometimes would use colored glass uh, in order to create more um, to bring in more. Uh, warm light in particular areas of the house. Let's say we had, there is um, there's this famous house where there's a big long corridor facing just the north. And you know how the northern light is always this kind of more kind mm -hmm. of uh, yeah, cold. And all the windows are just painted yellow. And the atmosphere inside that corridor is very different. So I think that there's, there's many, many beautiful possibilities on understanding our sink, our windows and the glass of our windows with color. And I'm not talking about every single one of the windows, but in particular areas of the houses, according to the orientation. Uh, this is something for sure. And I think the floor, not necessarily curvilinear, but understanding the floor and as a check, as a texture with uh, what it means to actually stand uh, with your uh, bare feet, because it's really, really much easier to be bare feet in a house than outside and to enjoy that, uh, that connection. Uh, I think these are two, pretty much uh, easy things to, to think about. Right. Yeah, I think um, the, the, uh, I was in, when I was in Japan many years ago, uh, I went to a friend's house who had worked here. And I saw when he moved back, I went and they had a, uh, a cabinet right at the door and you put your shoes in the cabinet yeah. and you never went into the house with your shoes. Yes. And, and my son does that now is we can't go into his house. He has the same thing, but he never saw the Japanese experience, but he has a small baby and he doesn't want anybody to have shoes on the floor. Yeah. So 
the tamami floors in Japan are also a very different experience and way softer in the touch and the way right the, the, yeah the textures what yeah. about color um did he what did he because every image is black and white photographs yes what kind of color did he imagine in it um in that uh, space the color clock is the different um uh like in the beginning of the day it was yellow then it would turn towards red and then during lunch time it would be some cooling blue it will turn a greenish and then again uh, towards this yellow oak thing so during the day these were the colors that would change inside the house uh for the colors of the glasses he doesn't say anything he just say there have to be there has to be color but he doesn't say that the wall the walls would just be white no. to reflect no or no 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 not not really because no? oh, okay. he had also some very strong uh, ideas regarding art he detested uh, frames and paintings that are put on a frame on a on a wall he thought that art should grow organically uh, by the inhabitants so he thought that there could be murals painted by the inhabitants on the walls oh okay so but not as, yes but not at something that is like you know as a a thing that stands out through a frame and stands there because he used to he believed that you just put the frame there it's there the painting or whatever the poster and then you just forget about it so he thought that the that the inhabitants could actually start painting murals on their own that can change and can evolve and can be part it was a very mm -hmm. yeah a very imaginative uh, uh place so the first thing i thought i've seen this house before but the first thing i thought i'm still looking for any more questions from everybody in the audience but in the meantime uh, I thought of the comparison between Le Corbusier's uh, Villa Savoy and this because they're both raised up and yet um, what is the, um, you know, is there a comparison? Is there any reasonable thing to look at there? How they see a life lifestyle? Is one more internal, one more external? Or what, what would you think? Le Corbusier definitely raised it because he was also fascinated by the car and much earlier than Kistler actually. And in the ground floor of uh, Villa Savoy, the idea is that the car comes through the columns and there's a, there's a whole parking parking place. There's a garage. Half of the ground right. half of the ground floor is the garage. And then the entrance, the, the, the process of entering has a few similarities because on the ground floor, after you leave the garage, there are some freestanding uh, sinks uh, on, the on the ground floor that you can actually wash your hands and cleanse yourself a little bit before you start going up. And the going up in Le Corbusier is equally ritualistic because we have this beautiful long ramp, which was also very, it was not the, it was not the norm back then. We have two ways. There's like a circular staircase that is for more quick, functional up and downs, and we have the ramp. Uh, the difference with Le Corbusier, I think, is that then the environment is too prescribed in a way. I mean, Kistler is too prescribed as well, but Kistler imagined the... Um, the people living, I think, a little bit more freely in terms of how the spaces are continuous next to each other. For Le Corbusier, there were clear divisions. The kitchen is on one corner, the living room is in one corner, but he uh, creates visual connections. Uh, so that's, I would say, a step just before Kistler, who creates both mm -hmm. visual and actual physical connections, because Le Corbusier creates too many physical connections. It's really fascinating. And of course, the connection with the bath, this amazing bathtub, which is by, just next to the to the bedroom and you can really move from your bedroom to the bathtub is fantastic. Uh, Le Corbusier's Villa Savoie has come to mind many times in relation to Kistler because Le Corbusier's Villa Savoie is like we all worship historians and it's like a standard example we all know we teach to the students and as a house it was only uh, lived for six months because the inhabitant hated it. They just hated it and they left wow. after six months because it was not well heated it was always cold and because Mr. Savoy was very upset that his wife would actually overlook the living room through her boudoir because of this visual connection. So he didn't like this thing at all. He would be there with huh. his friends smoking cigars. And there was this glass facade on this uh, open, open, you know, this in the second floor uh, outdoor space. There's this glass facade and the boudoir was there and there's a window so she could see everything he was doing. <laughs> So the, the building was abandoned almost after six months and never lived yeah. ever and properly. Yeah. So that's why I, I, cons I, I actually, I, would everybody actually have lived in the endless house? Would they have managed to live? Who knows? Uh, we have two more questions. So um, does Kessler have a relation to parallel art uh, movements like the Situationist or Fuxis that were trying to reimagine the life performance and the conditions of everyday life? Yeah, very nice question. What I know for sure, what is recorded for sure, is his connection with the surrealists. That is, that I can I can be completely sure about. For the surrealists, he even designed a very 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 fascinating exhibition. I had a small uh, a small image. 
um, mm -hmm. for, uh, for the Guggenheim Museum, where he basically rethought, and that was Kistler's, I think, intention in every design. He rethought what it means to exhibit and what it means to look uh, at an exhibit uh, as, a, as a visitor. So he created the special optical devices to look at the paintings. For example, he would put a painting and then a wall in front of it. And then there was only just a peep hole and there was a, a, a device that you could actually slowly rotate behind it the painting so you can look at it piece by piece. He would create special furniture that you could lie down and look at the painting on the ceiling or stuff like that. He did that for the surrealists. So the connection with the surrealists is historically recorded and I know with the situationists that came later, I don't really know, we don't have any evidence, but uh, I, I really think that uh, the connections are there. We, ca we can actually claim these connections. So we have a couple more. Let's see, um, if a model is built, would, would it be able to be used to test the level of airflow? I think maybe the concern is how does the air move through that space? Yes. No, I think it would be able to test that because he was also he was saying that the windows should be should be placed according to how the light looks from the inside and how the wind flows and travels. There is plenty of windows in all the cardinal directions, so I think ventilation would probably work. But I think if a model was built, yes, we could probably te test that depending on specific locations and how wind works. I would say yes. So we have, we have a, I'm not sure. Okay, you had a photograph of him uh, drawing and there was a cat yes. holding down the, so yes. he definitely liked cats. Yes, he and, does. And Steve Ziger has shared a story about his childhood. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, which said that uh, he showed, let's see, a poor Mississippi farmer showed him a beautiful round barn when asked, it was, showed, his, showed his aunt. Uh, round barn when, at, when, it, when asked of why it was round, she said, so the cats don't pee in the corner. Do you think maybe that's what he uh, was thinking? Is that he wouldn't want the cats in to <laughs> uh, to find a corner? That's is that fantastic. maybe that was a connection? So maybe the connection between cats and Kessler is something you want to add to your research. Absolutely. I and know then, he, uh, hated, he hated all the contemporary architecture for the birds hitting on the glass uh, facades, and uh, he was saying that even cats know how to climb out of a fence or something like that with all mm -hmm. the all the boundaries that contemporary architecture of his time was creating. He was right. right. Even cats know how to escape that. So why should they, they can escape? Yeah. And then um, I'm not sure if you covered this in the talk, but um, another question is how many buildings of his were built? The Shrine of the Books, I think, is the only building right. building. He built extensively designs, uh, theater sets. Okay. And exhibitions. And the Shrine of the Books in Jerusalem is, I think, his only one actually built. Only one built. Yeah. Okay. How did he fund his practice? <laughs> I think he was getting a lot of money from the from the design sets for theaters. I think that oh, was for theater main, design. Okay, yeah, that was his main. Okay, he uh, Kisler studied in Vienna, and he mm -hmm. he studied both uh, engineering and arts. And he there in Vienna he did for the first time a very innovative design set with a rotating stage in 1920 something, which wow. back then was very important. And because of that, he was invited in New York. Uh, for an exhibition and then he settled there and he had a big big um, he had a lot of work in uh, in the arts and the theater a lot a lot of different design sets mm -hmm. he did facades for uh, stores so not proper buildings but a lot of facades he he built built many furniture and uh, yeah he was uh, very very active and writing like crazy on the side so he was busy he was a busy person very, great very much. Okay, one last question that I have, and I think we have to wrap unless there's any more coming. Um, and that is with the pandemic and knowing what it's like to be in, in, to, in the house all the time, how would you look at this house now in light of the fact that you might be um, quarantined to it for four months? Yes. Is it, is, it, is it comfortable to go up, climb up on the roof and hang out there or is there room or does it feel like what does you're, it asking, feel like? you're asking the wrong person because I'm all about walking <laughs> in the city. So I, I think no matter how beautiful or how imaginative or how great a house would be, I would always feel trapped. I'm all about, um, I love the cities. I think public life is way more important than uh, like, um, I think public life is what makes us, uh, the societies we are, the architects we are, the communities we are, we are, and that's very important. And that's why the pandemic has been such a very serious thing. It's not just because 
the financial reasons, the political reasons. It's just that we are public animals. Public life, political life is what brings us together, what makes us be. Uh, Vitruvius speculates that people uh, started talking because they found themselves uh, around a big fire, so the first public space, hitting themselves around the fire. So speech and thought came into big because we're with each other. So public space for me is really where we need to be and where we actually need to be. Keep, keep improving and keep improving along with the houses, but public space is our common shared house and it's a really important place. Great. Well, thank you so much from the um, from me thank and the you. committee and everyone involved. And you met Kelly and Margaret and Olivia. So, uh, and, and obviously, thank you to Joe because uh, Joe brought this up, and uh, it wasn't a place we had we hadn't been looking for you, but it was great that we found you. Um, yes. And thank so, you for the questions they were really beautiful. Thank you for the opportunity was amazing for me, and thank you for being so helpful, so kind, so flexible with everything. So Margaret's going to change the slide for me, I think. And I just want to say um, the next lecture is on April 13th, which will explore public space design, branding environments, graphic design, architectural fabrication, and education in the light of the pandemic. Thank you once again to our, our lecture series sponsors, and thank you for joining AIA Baltimore and Baltimore Architecture Foundation today for the lecture series. We appreciate your support as we continue in a digital sphere this year. We hope to see you in person soon.